Hello and welcome to video number four. We really get stuck into economics with this video. We look at a real fundamental tool of, of economics, demand, and the demand curve. Um, so let's start by defining precisely what demand is. I mean, it's got nothing to do with, you know, I demand something, uh, the way that the word is used normally. It's a very precise uh, concept in economics. So let's have a look at the definition. Demand measures the quantity of a good that will be purchased at a given price in a given time period. We can talk about the demand for cakes, demand for cakes in a particular bakery shop, or the demand for cakes across a whole country per year at a particular price. And, uh, and that will that'll be a piece of statistical information. Now, note that effective demand is the willingness and ability to buy a good. Uh, I have uh, the ability to go out and buy kilos and kilos and kilos of potatoes today, but I'm not going to. I don't have the willingness. I have the ability, but I'm not going to demand those potatoes because I don't want those potatoes. So having the ability to pay for something is not demand. On the other hand, I would love to buy a Ferrari sports car, but uh, I certainly have the willingness. However, I don't have the ability to buy a sports car, so I'm, I'm not able to demand the car. So when both willingness and ability to buy a good in some quantity exists at a certain price, then we say the demand is effective. That's effective demand. Now, we can plot on a graph using a demand curve the statistical information that we could gather as we learn how much of a product would be demanded at particular prices. And we plot this like, like so. The price of the good and the quantity of the good that will be bought are measured on the vertical and horizontal axis um, respectively. And this demand curve is actually made up of lots of individual points that connect the price and the quantity. Let, let, let's work with some examples. This might be uh, a demand curve for uh, potatoes. This is the market for potatoes. And here we have the price per kilo, and we can put this in pounds, and maybe it's something like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. And here we have the quantity uh, of thousands of uh, bags of potatoes that will get bought, and this might be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and so on. Now, this data on this demand curve tells me, for example, that if the price were to be four pounds, then this point on the demand curve is telling me that the demand quantity will be 40. 40, uh, let's say this is bags of potatoes, 40 bags of potatoes will be bought when the price is four. I know this from this point on the demand curve. And I can also see that if the price was higher, less would be bought. Okay, the, the negative gradient of this demand curve is telling me there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity. So when the price is higher, say six pounds, well, the quantity of potatoes being bought will be less. And if the price was lower, two pounds, well, this point on the demand curve tells me that more will be bought. So the lower the price, the greater is the quantity demanded. Okay, and that's a product of the downward sloping demand curve. In fact, I could say that better the other way around. The demand curve is downward sloping because there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. The higher the price is, the fewer people have the willingness and ability to be able to buy a good, hence less is demanded. If the price changes, you see, we simply relocate to another point on the existing demand curve. The demand curve is lots and lots of individual points describing how much will be demanded at various prices. So were the price to change, we simply have to go to the new price and see, well, what is the quantity demanded? There's no need to move the whole curve when the price changes. We simply go to the 
the, the new price and we can read off how much quantity is demanded. Okay, let's move on. We assume, we assume ceteris paribus, this phrase ceteris paribus is Latin and it means all other factors remain constant. When we are looking at demand, we're assuming that all other factors are remaining constant. When price changes, quantity demanded changes and it causes a movement along the demand curve. And that's what we just saw. As people ass assess, as consumers, buyers assess whether they have the willingness and ability to buy a good, and as they reassess that when, when, uh, when the price changes, as we just saw, we are assuming that all other factors remain constant. We are assuming ceteris paribus. What other factors have to be remaining constant? Well, that's something we can look at here. Because there are other factors that have to be taken into account by consumers as they decide whether they have the willingness and the, or the ability to go ahead and, uh, and act uh, on their demand. So we have to remember that you know, income levels are remaining constant. Uh, as people decide when price changes, do they still want to demand a good? But income levels can change, and that affects people's willingness and ability to demand goods. The size of the population that we're talking about, of course, if a population grows, then at any particular price, more of a good is likely to be demanded. The price of other goods will influence our willingness and ability to buy a particular good. So. However much Coca-Cola is demanded, when the price of Pepsi changes, it will affect the demand for Coca-Cola, even though the price of Coca-Cola never changed. Um, and then other issues, marketing, fashion, law, the weather, such things can change and that can affect the, uh, the willingness to demand. If one of these changes, if one of these factors, which is not the price of the good, but if one of these factors were to change, well, in that case, the demand curve itself must change. I'm showing here an outward shift of the demand curve. Let's say that this is the market for beef. This is the market for beef. And look at demand curve one. This tells us all the points on demand curve one are telling us about various prices of beef, how much beef would be demanded. For example, this price here, let's call it P1. At price P1, we can read off, initially, quantity Q1 of beef was being demanded. But that does not have to remain so. Something may change, that uh, some other factor than price may have changed, which has led to a, a, a change in how much beef will get demanded at price P1. Let's imagine that the size of the population grew. After the growth in the population size, at price P1, it is no longer Q1 that gets demanded, but Q2 gets demanded. The price never changed. It's just that, as I said, there was an increase in the size of population, and more people are now willing and able to buy uh, demand beef at price P1. And indeed, every single point along the D1 demand curve shifted outwards to a new position, showing that whatever the price was, more would be demanded after the, after the, the rise in the population. This could have been caused by health news that said eating beef is extremely good for you. That would have changed, it's a kind of marketing, and that would have changed people's uh, awareness of, of the product and encourage them to buy more of it at whatever the price was. Or perhaps the price of chicken increased, which meant people bought less chicken and switched into buying more beef as a substitute, as an alternative. Um, or maybe incomes levels, income levels changed across the country and people that changed people's willingness to buy beef. What we can say is this, it wasn't a change in price, it was a change in one of those other factors. And that leads me to the rule that when price changes, 
we move along the curve, but when any of those other factors change, we move the entire curve. Now there are some special cases. Veblen goods, Giffen goods, you may see these types of goods described, and these are very rare cases, very rare, but they do in fact have demand curves, price, quantity, which slope upwards, indicating very strangely that higher prices lead to higher quantities demanded. Um, I, I, really, I really debated even whether to put this on the video. It's not important. It's very odd, a very odd case, named after Torsten Veblen, who argued that there are certain kinds of goods which have a snob value, and when the price is higher, people want to buy more of it, perhaps uh, the work of a certain artist. Uh, the more successful the artist gets, and the higher the price of the goods, well, the more demand there is for that artist's work, perhaps, is an example. Or Giffen goods, which um, are not snob goods, but uh, Giffen goods uh, are goods which, um, as their price goes up, uh, they're very, very essential goods, and as their price goes up, certain people may reject buying anything else as they devote all of their income to the purchase of this very important good. Perhaps bread, in certain social circumstances, um, have, has been dis bread has been identified as a pos possible given good. Certainly before the French Revolution, the price of bread in Paris rose, and people uh, in, uh, in the urban areas, uh, urban poor of Paris, apparently um, started to buy more bread as they rejected buying anything else because they, they, they devoted all their resources to, to buying bread. Um, but some economists argue whether, whether given goods even exist at all. Anyway, these are rare cases of, of, of upward sloping demand curves, but really you shouldn't even worry yourself about, about given goods at all. So, to recap, Remember, if there's a change in price, we move along the demand curve and we describe it when we're writing or speaking as a change in quantity demanded. And note that that's different to when there is a change in any other variable but not price. Any other variable like income levels, size of population, price of another good, marketing, whatever. Then we, we shift the entire D curve and we say it is a change in demand. So a change in price causes this to happen. We might go from price one, quantity one, to price two, and there's a fall in the quantity demanded. But when something else changes, when there's a change in some other variable, we actually shift the entire demand curve outwards or inwards, depending on how people have reacted and how they have changed their demand when one of those other variables changes. You know, the difficulty, of course, in the real world with drawing real demand curves is gathering enough information. Even retrospectively, if we look back at what happened when prices changed in a market, let's say we looked at the car market and we looked last year when the price of cars changed what happened to the quantity demanded for cars and we can study it and perhaps we could even draw the demand curve as it existed then but that doesn't mean that's still the demand curve today because in the intervening time all those other variables will have changed there will have been changes in the price of bicycles and public transport there will have been changes in the size of the population changes in income levels changes in marketing even the cars the product itself may have changed so, in, in practice, it's extremely difficult to build accurate and current demand curves. And you may think, well, you know, what's the point? And also this ceteris paribus, I mean, how can we assume that everything else is staying constant? Because all those variables are constantly changing in the real world. And this is something you're going to have to cope with in economics generally. A lot of it is theoretical. And, and we make assumptions and we simplify things so we can study. And that doesn't, that, don't think that that diminishes economics. Don't think it disconnects it from the real world. We have to simplify it to get a grip on our understanding. As long as we remember that the real world is, um, is more complicated, uh, then, then it's okay to look at these theoretically simple, uh, simple examples. And, you know, if it, 
if it was easy to attach the theory to the real world, well, ec economics would have been solved a long time ago. And the, the fact is that it isn't easy, and that's why there's continuing debates in economics um, about how, how connected the real world is uh, to the theory. I suppose I should say that the other way around, how connected the theory is to the real world. But that's what makes it interesting, isn't it? It's not an exact science, it's very complicated, and there are so many variables changing all the time that will, you know, will, will, it makes the economy incredibly complex, and we'll be debating it forever, I'm sure. Anyway, that's the demand curve. Um, I hope that helped, and I'll see you in the next video um, next week. Bye-bye.